Okay. So, um, so, okay, so welcome to lecture one of ECE 5312. And so, in today's lecture, what we're going to look at is, this is really sort of the introduction to the rest of this course. Why are we here? Why is digital communications important? And then we're going to sort of kickstart sort of the, the theoretical fundamentals of what we're going to deal with, uh, starting with a very basic review of, um, of random variables, all right? So, um, we live in an age that's surrounded by information, right? I think we're all attached to our smartphones, our laptops, uh, all our intelligent devices everywhere, right? Wirelessly, fiber optics, um, by copper twisted pair. Um, so, so really information surrounds us. We're immersed in it. Um, even, even something as simple, especially given the weather today, uh, our electronic thermostats. I was talking with a friend of mine from the U.S. Naval Academy and he got his parents for Christmas um, um, an app and ther electric thermostats that can be controlled by one's iPhone. Great. So, um, at a greater level, uh, things like financial transactions, entertainment, education, defense, um, uh, public safety, telemedicine, there are all these sort of applications that sort of need information reliably delivered to them as well as providing it to people who need to process that information. So, as a result, what happens is communications needs to have several very key traits, okay? Any sort of communication. So you can imagine um, that communications needs to be robust to error, needs to have sufficiently high data rates, and needs to satisfy network capacity. So what I mean by that? So first of all, if you're talking on your cell phone, would you tolerate hearing, let's say, some conversation where every second word is dropped? Absolutely not. It would ruin the experience you might say, send me an email. I can't talk with you anymore. The experience just got tarnished. So many errors introduced in the channel. Sufficient data rates. Like, like, for instance, if you're streaming YouTube onto your smartphone, right? And let's say the network is, is, is pretty congested. Like, you know, again, the experience is ruined when you're like watching that video and then it pauses and you see the little green circle turning around and then it goes on and then pauses. Again, ruins the experience for a human user. And then satisfying network capacity. So there are 22-ish of us in here and stuff. So and then this entire building might have a few hundred people. Let's say we all, let, let's do an experiment. Let's all take out our smartphones. I'm assuming all of you have smartphones. And go to YouTube, choose your favorite cat video, and turn it on and watch it. And then we'll go to the classroom on the other side and ask those 20 some folks to do the same, and then we'll do that throughout the entire building. Very quickly, AT&T, Verizon, Sprint, and all these other cellular service providers are going to wonder, hey, what's going on? And, you know, we're going to try and bring down this, the network, right? So, so really, all of these also have a little bit of trade-offs associated with them. So, for instance, uh, the network capacity and uh, the data rates sort of, sort of conflict a little bit with each other. Because suppose, let's say everybody just sends SMS or text messages to loved ones and stuff. And we all do that, right? Very narrow band, and it can accommodate a ton of people. But is that the experience that we're looking for? So if we want video experience, that requires a substantially higher data rate, substantial higher amount of bandwidth. And therefore, the number of users that can be accommodated within a particular region or building is much less. So there is these conflicting trade-offs. And also robustness to error. If we send a text message, how robust? to error. It's actually pretty robust. It's just a, you know, what, 150 or 60 byte or kil sorry, kilobyte word at whatever network to receive reliably. Video on your hand, you have MPEG errors and you have other sorts of distortion that can be introduced to it. So, like this is, this is sort of answered in more of a hands-on type of communication course where we come in. So information theory people will talk about the capacity. They'll say, what is the theoretical limit of this network? How many people can we accommodate at the same time looking at YouTube cat videos on their smartphones all at the same time in a single cell site? Um, and then the data rate thing, that's more like a communication engineering course where we're going to try and design, let's say, modulation schemes and uh, transmitters and receivers that can max out. Let's say, a if you're given this much bandwidth and this amount of time, how can you cram, cram as many bits into that transmission as possible? course doesn't necessarily come up with ways to counteract um, possible errors. It tries to quantify them, you know, because that's a key tool, right? 
whenever there's a business decision, how do we deploy it? How's our network doing? Like, the last thing your boss wants to hear is, oh, pretty good. Can I, can I make a business decision on that? Like, I would need to go in front of, let's say, an audience, or let's say to the board of directors, and I'll say, uh, we, uh, we have 6.9 reliability in our network. And you might say, what's 6.9? 99.9999, so 6.9, so there's a decimal after the first two nines, uh, percent on, which means, uh, you know, that, that remaining difference is when you have an outage in your network. Six nines is great, right? So, so be careful. When someone says, oh yeah, this is 90, like, you know, see TV promotions, oh, we have 99% reliability. Only? That network over there has 99.9% .9 reliability per year, you know? So, so be careful what people market. But where did it get that measure? And you can do this all theoretically, because engineers, especially at the graduate level, our biggest tool set is math. So we take the physical world around us, and we try and characterize the communication system, which I drew a block diagram here. And this block diagram is kind of cool, because what is sort of the basic building blocks of any digital communication system. And they can be represented by mathematical models, all of them. And that means it lends itself to analysis. You might say, well, what about the randomness? Solar flare activity, lightning strikes, different types of data. What happens if there's a flash crowd? And like, let's suppose all of us do take out our smartphones, and then we, we, we start downloading those videos and such, and the capacity is affected, which affects throughput, which affects the quality of video, and therefore the air that. And it's totally random. We don't tell this in advance to anyone but ourselves, right? This will be our little secret. It's a mathematical tool. So what's the problem behind random variables and random processes? The thing is, we don't care about finding out exactly when something's going to happen. Like, you know, at this point, this black box will produce this value. I rather care about, on average, what is the likelihood I will get this value from this black box? What is the likelihood I would get an error under these circumstances? It's the math. If I can characterize something, I can understand it, and I can better uh, sort of explain it to someone what is the likelihood of the performance being this level of quality. So I have here, you'll see it everywhere, Sklar and, and Proacus and others, they, th this is like tr the traditional um, digital communication system block diagram. You've got your binary source. And I love this because what happens is what does binary source mean? Binary source is essentially Wah, 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 wah. You know, here I am, I'm blabbing, but I'm an analog signal, right? Audio waves traveling through the air. They've got to be discretized, they've got to be quantized, they've got to be converted into ones and zeros. Then, the quantized, discretized version of Professor Wiglinski now is a binary source. Hey, readings outside with those digital thermometers and stuff. The reading itself, like, you know, you have like an analog circuit or something that's saying, oh, <laughs> it's pretty cold out there in Fahrenheit or in Celsius, depends like, you know, how you convert it. But what happens is then that measurement, the, all those strings of measurements get quantized, digitized into ones and zeros, and that's your binary source. So the cool thing is in this course, we don't care what is the binary source. We, don't, we, we, we really sort of abstract everything. Our fundamental unit of information in this course is the bit. If you go to a networking course, the fundamental unit of information will be the packet. We're several layers below that. If you go to an uh, antennas course and stuff, it's a little different. It's more like electromagnetic waves you, or down at, to the electrons and stuff. So everyone's looking at different levels. Look at bits. Bits, bits, bits. This is going to be sort of our currency for this course. So all those bits are produced somehow, some process. Okay? The first thing that we do is we strip out redundancy. Sounds funny, but it's true. What happens is speech, there's probably tons of redundant information that you can extract, out, compress. So it's just like what those zip files do, right? All, like you take a, a bitmap. Have you ever noticed when you take a bitmap and you compress it, it compresses about 95% because there's tons of redundant patterns that can be removed and you can replace them by special code words. And then you want to put a little bit of error, uh, error correction coding into it. And what that does is you introduce your own special redundancy. Not a lot, but enough to sort of say, 
if, let's say, one bit gets corrupted, I can sort of fill in the blank, you know, and, and identify that. Then we modulate, and that's the beautiful part. The modulations where you go, and we'll, we'll be talking a lot about it in this course, where we go from ones and zeros to essentially physical waveform properties, right? Amplitude, or phase, or frequency modulation, or a combination thereof. And we convert a digital to analog converter into an analog waveform that then gets upconverted from DC, from zero hertz, to gigahertz in frequency and send over the air. And then hit something called the channel. Channel can be anything. The air is a channel. Like, so that wireless access point over there in the corner of the room, communicating electromagnetic waves through the space, and then it goes to Travis's laptop over there. And what happens is, as it travels through the air, it's, there are multiple copies of that radiation that are bouncing all over the place. And then, let's say there is some solar flare activity. It influences the, 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 the signal just a little bit. So Travis's laptop is trying to sort of figure out what has been received. So the channel is really where we introduce all the other electromagnetic phenomenon in the area, right? Reflections, refractions, other sources of noise and interference. The receiver undoes all of this with, with a few extra blocks, including timing and synchronization and, and, and equalization. These blocks, which we don't see in the transmitter, because we're getting these signals like without any potentially any information. So it's like, where should I start demodulating? Where should I start decoding? Where, should I st where, where does the information start? When do I start processing this stuff? It has to be done independently, and there are techniques out there that does this. And then you do the rest of the chain to get back to your binary sync. So it's not like a kitchen sink, but that's where all the information goes, and then it's repackaged into what a human or whatever needs to make a decision on or watch. So. You look at this, and I said, okay, where's the math? Well, okay, math. Or model these boxes mathematically. So two, um, what's deterministic and what is random? Data compression, deterministic. There's a formula. So this code word, and you do it all over, and it's a predictable deterministic set of formulas for doing that. Error correction, exactly the same thing, deterministic. Modulation, totally deterministic. And the analog digital conversion, all of that stuff is deterministic. But there are two places that are extremely random, and that's what we're going to look at in this course. That's what we're going to analyze. That's where that probability random processes knowledge comes from. The binary. No. See? So what happens is the binary source is random. It just spews out ones and zeros in any pattern. Right? And we'll look at that. We'll characterize that. The other thing is itself. What's happening out in the air? Like, let's say that solar flare activity. How, about, how do we know that this happens? The noise floor increases. Something bad in the channel happens. Some of it is deterministic. So we're going to look at, in the first part, things like the binary source and the channel and how they can be random. So let's look at the binary source. Ah, OK. The binary source, I usually folks like to represent this uh, using something called a Bernoulli random variable. All right. So with a Bernoulli random variable, I've, I've described, described it here in terms of the probability density function, or PDF. And what it is is Bernoulli, it's a black box. So any random variable. So let's, let's, let's try out this technology, OK? Everyone keep your fingers crossed. And transfer over to computer. OK. And hopefully this thing works too. OK. So what happens is a random variable, I like to refer to it as some sort of black box, OK? So black. And what it does is this random variable, x, will, per, will if you say, OK, random variable, give me a value. Boom, it gives you little x. And then you go back to it and you say, hey, give me another value. Boom, it gives you another value. What ends up happening is if you 
do some sort of histogram of x, and you see what sort of values are produced by it, eventually you might get something that looks like this. Like, let's say it looks like a bell curve or something. And, and as we'll see a little bit later, this, is called, this, this turns out if, let's say, this thing, black box, produces values from minus infinity to plus infinity, what ends up happening is this, is this distribution here looks like a Gaussian. Right? So there are actually names for these specific types of distributions. And so what the black box does, the random variable, is uh, it produces these, these deterministic values, but we don't know which one. But what this guy does here, and that's our PDF, our probability density function, what, what he does, essentially, is it takes all those values and try and characterizes the vertical axis is the probability. It's the likelihood that the value 0 will be produced by the black box. Let's say one with the value 1. Well, still has a pretty high probability, but let's say the value 1,000 actually has a much lower probability of happening than, let's say, value 0 or value 1 and everything in between. So if we now go back to our Bernoulli PDF, what do we have here? We essentially have only two values that are produced by the Bernoulli random variable, the black box, 1 or 0. And the height of that PDF, a 1 is produced, or a 0 is produced in this case, right? And this, you know, so if you have a Bernoulli random number generator, all it's doing is spewing out 1s and zeros in a stream. And, it, and if you look at it statistically over a very long period of time, it is equal to, like, you know, you should have proportionally, like, the like, like let's say it's 40% likely that you have zeros and 60% likely that you have ones. Over a long period of time, there should be 40% zeros and 60% ones. All right. Okay. So that's, that's some of the randomness at the source. But, but that, to, to, to us, that's really, that's kind of important, but it doesn't really, in a lot of cases, knowing how the source transmits is not vital to characterizing the likelihood of it having an error. That is where the channel comes in. And the channel can be an assortment of variables. All right? The channel, the medium, copper, fiber, air, underwater, if you're into that sort of thing, all of these mediums, when you send your signal across it, influence it. The receiver has maybe a hard time figuring out what's happening. And it's usually not very detectable. Even like, you know, we hold our breaths and we see of those waves around this room. Even though we might not be moving, let's say there's a lot of wind outside or there's seismic activity. The walls are moving, right? And or the vibration. Let's say that fan on that projector or something vibrates the tile there. There's a, now a sense of randomness, right? As long as there's movement, there's randomness. And so the, the two major influencers in the channel that might affect your signal is going to be noise and fading. So we already talked about this beauty, Gaussian random variable, the bell curve, right? And, it, and, the, and the PDF, the, the probability density function, is 100% characterized by essentially this uh, this this expression here, and we'll be seeing that expression in this course a lot, because in this course we're going to be dealing with Gaussian, 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 Gaussian noise. The the other three, we're going to see a lot less in this class, but you should be aware of them. So the first one, and you might have heard of it, especially if you've done wireless things before, um, is something called the Rayleigh random variable. And we're actually going to look at Rayleigh. How do so, for instance, if you want to make your own random generator that does Rayleigh random numbers, right? Or numbers that are Rayleigh distributed, and all you've got is Gaussian, it's possible. And it's kind of related to what we're going to be talking about a little bit later, fan noise, right? So Rayleigh, ran uh, Rayleigh random variables usually are used to describe um, in a lot of cases, the, the, the strength of a replica of a signal that has bounced off of a wall. So, the, so Ray, Rayleigh definitely has a role, but in this course, 
Because Rayleigh random variables are a little bit mathematically tedious to analyze, we won't deal with them too much here. You, but you should be aware that there is this thing called Rayleigh. And if you ever do deal with like fading channels and such, Rayleigh comes up a lot. Um, uniform random variables, that's, again, something that uh, comes mostly when you're talking about, let's say, phase noise. When we usually characterize, like, let's say, what's the phase of this transmission? Uh, we usually assume it can have any phase, any likely phase value, equally likely. So when somebody says any of these possible options are equally likely to occur, it screams out uni uniform random variable. Last but not least, exponential random variable. It's up again also in channel modeling in terms of how close like, you know, like let's say copies of a transmitted signal that are bouncing off the walls and stuff, how close or how far, or like what's the statistical average, what's the likelihood, what's the characterization of the spacing of those clusters of reflections across the surface? We usually use random variables to characterize it. So, so in a nutshell, I've shown you five random variables. So you might have seen them in probability classes before that we're going to rely on. Gaussian, by far, we're going to see a lot of. It's going to be your best friend for the next 14 weeks. But the other four, you should be aware of them because they will come up um, once in a while here and there. All right? Okay. So, as I mentioned before, the, ob the objective of this course is to essentially is to essentially quantitatively assess the performance of digital communication systems. So if we go back to that slide, all the blocks, everything's deterministic, that's a piece of cake. We can easily analyze when is the error going to happen. And, and theoretically, error should never happen if we design this thing perfectly. If everything is deterministic, that's great. It's the randomness that creates the problems. So how does the randomness affect our digital communication system design, and can we put a number to it? Like, how likely is it that I'm going to have a bit error? So that, by far, is going to be the metric that we're going to live, li, um, live in this course, is essentially what is the likelihood, what is the probability that I will receive a bit in error out of all these bits that have been transmitted in this burst? So the probability of bit error or bit error how well or how poorly our communication system is working and is designed and operating in a specific environment with specific amount of distortion introduced. All right? So, so what happens is that's where probability comes in. Okay? So what we're going to do now is we're going to jump in headfirst into looking a little bit about what is random, uh, what are random variables. And then and later on, we're going to look at random processes, which is all the fun. <laughs> okay. So, okay, so yeah, you probably know that I like random variables. So, because I teach the other course too sometimes. So, the random variable. So, as I described before, the random variable, the random variable uh, X, let's say, we usually keep random variables in capitals. All it really is, it's a mapping. So, so what do engineers do best, or what we theoretically should do best? We should be able to use math to solve really complicated problems. So for instance, like let's say if any of you go to a casino and you play blackjack, or you play like you know rolling die, or you know roulette and such, and you know uh, you roll the die and you have two dice. How do we translate the word problem into a mathematical expression, right? I think in the probability course that I teach, that's the biggest problem, making the leap from the word problem to the math problem. What does, what does random variables, how does that help us? And let's, let's look at that. So what, what random variables do, essentially, is we have an, a space, a sample set, so let's say, and these are all the outcomes that, um, so we have some sort of space, and let's say we have an outcome, omega. So let's say that's the outcome that, let's say if you go, uh, like if you have a deck of 52 cards, I pull out uh, the two of hearts. 
uh, you know, so that's great. Two of hearts or, uh, jack, uh, you know, jack of, jack of, uh, you know, um, uh, jack of spades or um, uh, king of diamonds or uh, an, a, a ace of hearts or any of those cards. But let's say I want to put this to math. Well, let's say I want to calculate what is the probability of me getting one of those cards. Um, better yet, if, you, if, you're, if you're like my brother-in-law, what he normally does is he takes three decks and mix them together and stuff, and that makes things very interesting. And then he's missing a few cards, so things get really interesting after a while. But physically, okay, let's take that and model it as a mathematical expression. And what random variables do is essentially they take that outcome, omega, and map it to the real line and give it an actual value. So the random variable x maps omega, and what happens is it says, OK, that's equal to this value. So that black box I was telling you, what, what it really is is it's taking all these physical outcomes and mapping it to a number, mapping it to a number, mapping it to a number. And once we have it as a number, once we have it in terms of numbers, and then from those number equations, we're, we're golden because we can now use these advanced probability and random processes tools in order to analyze that, right? So really, the random variable maps, I'm going to put that here, maps physic the physical world to a numerical one. So that's, so that's what random variables do. And so in this case, what we want to do is we need some sort of way of comprehensively and 100% categorize a random variable, its behavior. How do you do that? Is it its average? No. The average just gives a little bit of its behavior, but it does not completely characterize the random variable. So it's variance. It's standard deviation. It's third order moment, fourth order moment, fifth order moment. Absolutely not. It gives you a snapshot of what that is doing. It is the relative distribution function and the probability density function, the CDF and the PDF, that 100% characterizes what that random variable does. What are these things? It is the histogram that I showed you before, that bell curve stuff, all those PDFs. What happens is it tells you Every, the, every possible value produced by that random variable, what is its probability of happening? If you is of that variable, you've completely characterized it. And then you can do all these sort of simple sort of mathematical manipulations to say, oh, the average value that you can get is this. Oh, the variance or the standard deviation is that. And so on and so forth, right? So the cumulative distribution function and the probability density function really sort of, like individually, each one of those 100% represents the behavior, the statistical behavior of your random variable. Now, um, there's some properties uh, of what the CDF does. So what the, C the CDF is essentially sort of an incremental integral derivative. So, so it's, it's one or the other. So if you don't like one, you can always switch over to the other. So let, let, let me draw that on the, like what do I mean by CDFs and PDFs? So we take that histogram, right? Um, uh, and we basically, since a Gaussian random variable can produce a continuum of values, we essentially have a continuum of a bell curve, right? From minus infinity to plus infinity. So that's our PDF. Now, um, you know, each one of these values defines some sort of probability of that value happening. So let's say the line down there, uh, this value, this height, tells me the probability of x happening. So the CDF is a very useful tool because what I do with a CDF is I integrate progressively from minus infinity to plus infinity of a PDF. And what that will do is give me something that accumulates and what's the maximum probability? One. So at the end, as I reach infinity, <laughs> story of my life, as I reach infinity, I should peak at a probability one. So what this CDF does is it tells me, let's say I draw x here. This tells me, so let's say the value 
of the CDF at that point, at x, tells me what is the probability that my random variable will produce a value that is less than or equal to little x. So let's say you have something like y over here. That's contained in that CDF probability, or all the way down to minus infinity. This is a useful tool, as we're going to see later on, because um, there's something that we deal with when we calculate a probability of error in Gaussian channels, like noise and such, something called Q functions, and something calculate these things uh, closed form-wise is very, very simple mathematical integrations taken care of for you. Okay. So let's So, so they're important because they will represent the behavior of the random variable. And so let's let's go let's like let's go to the chase. Let's actually look at a Gaussian. Okay. So again, so there's a, a number of ways of representing a Gaussian um, uh, in terms of um, sort of exp uh, not expression but like. Sort Subscript big X and then bracket little x. X is the x value, and the height is represented by f of x of x, and it's equal to this kind of messy-looking expression: um, one over the square root of two pi times sigma, which is a standard deviation of that Gaussian random variable, e to the minus x minus the mean of that Gaussian, all of that squared divided by two sigma squared. There is a, we also refer to Gaussian normal. <laughs> so I hate to say it, but they're not normal. So, so we usually represent Gaussian uh, also in terms of, um, like instead of, let's say, using this f of x of x, f of x, of x n, this, this calligraphy n, um, m sigma. And that's actually enough to completely characterize. In this case, it's kind of interesting. We can completely characterize a Gaussian by its mean and its variance. But how do you compute the probability of that Gaussian random variable with that specific PDF producing a value between x1 and x2? And the answer is, you look at its PDF, okay, and literally, you can do one of two things. You can either um, integrate um, the PDF from x1 to x2 under the curve, and that will give you the probability that the random variable will produce a value in that range. Or if you want to be sneaky and efficient, you take the CDF of x2 and minus, subtract that from the CDF of x1, because the integration is already taken care of for you, right? You're basically trying to find where the two CDFs don't overlap, and their difference will give you that same probability. Beautiful, huh? Power of CDFs. So the problem with Gaussians, and I think this is what makes this course so cool, because then you can show your friends like these funky-looking equations that have Qs in them and, and weird fractions in them, is that there is no closed-form solution for the integral of e to the x minus m squared divided by minus 2 sigma squared. There's no closed form solution. You can have lookup tables. So there's, like, there's this one book of just pure, by several Russian authors, mathematicians, that are just purely lookup tables. I've been asking people, hey, Christmas gift, but no one listens. The next best thing to having a lookup table is you can leave it in a form like what I have something called the Q function. The Q function is equal to this expre integral expression here. So what people do is they try and see, how can I manipulate this? How can we express this in terms of Q? And if you leave your answer in terms of Q, that's, that's the end of it. People, people will understand it. will say, yeah, that's cool. I understand what you're saying. That's fi as final as you can get without using supercomputers to solve for the answer. Beautiful. So as an exercise for the students, that's what EFTS means. I use this all over the place. 
Um, I w would love you guys to actually derive this expression for the probability of this random Gaussian random variable producing a value between x1 and x1. So you should really, really get some practice. Like see how you can derive this on your own using Q functions. Because all it is is uh, algebra, but you, it, it takes a little bit of looking. Like there's going to be some change. Okay? So fun math. Hey! So if you have nothing to do on Friday night. <laughs> Just to round out, um, you know, th uh, sort of the statistical averages and, and uh, uh, like, well, th this part of random variables, before we talk about random processes, let's look at some averages. So, so once we completely characterize information, you know, what happens if you go to your boss and say, okay, what type of noise do we have there? Oh, it's Gaussian. Okay, so what can you tell me about it? And then you draw the PDF. They'll say, okay, I don't care. What's the average value that, let's say, that noise will be that's generated by that channel? What's the mean? What's the variance? Same thing actually with, let's say, grades in a class, right? Do you, do, like, you know, sure, the professor, the professor comes with the graded test papers, draws the distribution on the class, so you have people at one end of the scale, you have people at the other end, you have a mass of people in the middle, and, you know, you kind of care, but, but you're really wondering, how, like, okay, you're somewhere in the middle, but are you doing good or are you doing bad? So then you ask, okay, where's the mean? Oh, the mean is 75. Okay. And you want to be within a standard deviation, the square root of the variance from that mean. Well, let's say you're a little bit on the low side. That has happened to me a few times in my undergrad studies myself. So I want to say, am I at least a standard deviation? So other things, like let's say if you do listening tests, um, if you have any friends that do speech communications, and uh, what happens is, can you tell which is the original sound file or audio file and which one's a quantized audio file? You know, so I had a lot of friends. I, I was in a research lab that was filled with audio and speech signal processing folks. And then I remember doing the test, and I would almost always get the right one, right? Oh, original, original, original. And they, what, you know what they do in the data set? They throw my, my, my data out because they say I'm a Six Sigma outlier. Basically, I'm, I would mess up the results. So they say, uh, we can excuse you, Alex, from, from these measurements. So did it for not. So sometimes we might want to know one specific fact of that communications channel, of the randomness. So there's something called the expected value, the mean, the expectation. And it's represented by E of that random variable, x. There's something called nth order moments. Suppose we find out what is the expectation of that random variable brought to the nth power. And with that, that nth order moment, we can do a lot of cool things, like variances. That's a second order and such. There's also things called central moments. Let's say we have a non-zero mean. So let's say we have a random variable that produces values that are not centered at zero. Okay? We want to maybe calculate what is the moment, but central. So central moment, we just subtract off the mean. And the variance is exactly that case if you don't have a zero mean random variable. So, okay. So, that concludes um, lecture one of, 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 of this course. Okay. Okay. So, fingers crossed that actually went somewhere. Woo! Okay. So, what we're going to do.